it's an honor and a privilege to be allowed to come and share my heart over something that has been developing over the years. Very artificial intelligence. And um, I thought maybe I should just give a little background. Fortunately, Torsten has given a lot of it. So in general, I'm on pension. That have been since 2006, but I'm still consulting and involved in the explosives industry. Um, I have an international profile in rock blasting and modeling. And from 1978 to 2006, I've been deeply involved with global blast modeling. Maybe the more important thing is that back in 1970, under Michael Cassidy and Mission 70, I came to faith in Christ. Um, Maureen and I are cross-denominational believers, although we sort of have main ties in the Anglican and Baptist churches. I'm an elder in the Neisner Baptist Church at the moment. And C.S. Lewis is my single most influential author, but I read a very wide spectrum of um, authors, and I'm not tied uh, only and specifically to him. Getting to definitions, we all have our own definitions, and I thought that it would be worth giving my definitions. Um, artificial intelligence to me is entrusting life to a knowledge system in a machine, however that knowledge system a, a, arrived. And for example, uh, I had a robotic prostatectomy two years ago whereby the surgeon sat in the corner of the room and I lay on a table underneath something that looked like a transformer robot. And um, that did a nice clean job in, in removing my prostate and uh, doing a good job of it. So what is very artificial intelligence? <laughs> and that is what I really want to talk about. It's doing this entrusting of life against the clear indication that the knowledge is wrong. For example, um, I think the, the best example recently was Boeing, ignoring the warnings of pilots and all kinds of other people with the crashes and the maneuvering capabilities of their 737 MAX aircraft, which they built in as a safety feature, but was actually a danger. So I call it pursuing wishful philosophies despite, despite hard counter evidence. Um, I'm reminded in the Bible, in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, when God says to, to Isaiah to say, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but not perceiving. Make the hearts of this people calloused, deaden their ears and their eyes, Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn to be healed. There's a great deal of that going on nowadays. I'm going to do a little overview of modeling and my personal exposure, although I've cut most of that out because we just don't have time. I've got, had a very interesting exposure to this and to very artificial stuff. I talk about key issues with all models and how to evaluate them. And what's the key to, to success? I've got an example that I'd like to talk through, but I don't think I'll have time for it now. The conclusions that I'm going to come through, I'm going to put them up right at the front. Modeling, um, whether we know it or not, strongly shapes our attitudes and decisions in life. There are simple models which are very easy to understand, and they're much more useful, but they're quite limited, and um, they're limited because they fail to explain the key questions or mechanisms behind them, and they create an appearance of orthodoxy, so they can be deceiving. Then you get um, the issue of the academic specialists who um, really are key to piloting our understanding in science, in philosophy, and theology. Um, unfortunately, although they are key, academia is subject to fallenness just as much as the laity. So you think that 
because they're academics, you can depend on them, well, not necessarily. And speaking as one who's interacted with top academics. The bottom line is that truth and reason are the things that lead to life. And you need to stick to that. And they lead to God's glory. And it's the ultimate test of whether your model is good or not. Just follow truth or reason. Looking at models that we're all dealing with at the moment, um, people are modeling COVID deaths. And the Imperial College, was, which is my alma mater, they've got a model being depended on by the um, many people around the world. Their first model looked like this. Um, for Britain and, and the United States. In the UK, they were looking at a peak of 13,400 deaths every day. Currently, they're at 43 and they're on the down, downturn. They've had 43,000 deaths altogether at the moment. They were expecting up to 510,000. So um, how do you like to be the government and to receive information like that in April? Actually, they didn't do much about it because I don't think you can do much about it when you get numbers like that. The USA was very similar. Um, they thought that um, they'd get up to 2.2 million deaths. Currently, they're up to 122,000. I, I doubt they'll get up to 2.2 million. The thing is that the, this Imperial College has a very high standing as, uh, as an orthodox, authentic people and look how wrong they got it. Another interesting thing that came up earlier this week, a statement in the Daily Maverick, that um, scientists say that the most likely number of contactable alien civilizations is 36. So I went and looked up this, and, and somebody in the States, a woman had got onto the Drake equation. John Drake wrote this back in the 50s. And it's this equation I've got at the bottom of the screen that um, if you fill in those numbers, you can work out on the basis of science in whole that we're not unique either as a living planet or as an intelligent species. So according to science, there are somewhere between 400 and, 400 and 200 civilization broadcasting their alien movies into the cosmos, just like us. Um, so coming down to the bottom line, there, there's two kinds of model, really. The one is the simple conceptual, empirical, statistical model where there's no mechanisms in it. People just have a feel that that's how it ought to be. And they look around and they put some numbers into it. So um, it's founded on simple relationships and guessing. <clears throat> and a, a very common one that people know is the common ideal gas law which is pressure times by volume divided by absolute temperature is a constant. And people use that and it works very well. But if you go into more detail and you look at what's actually happening um, and write it up and do research, you find that actually that's not good enough. And so something I had to deal with in my explosives um, modeling was non-ideal gas laws because in detonation, you get to very high pressures. So if we were dealing with ideal gases in explosives, they would follow this um, line, this horizontal line. But you can see for the different gases that are involved in explosives as it happens, that it's not linear, that pressure volume um, relationship, especially as the, tip, as the pressure goes up. You can see you're up to a thousand atmospheres there. But it's not only um, about um, numeric modeling for um, explosives. We have philosophical and theological modeling, and that gets quite dangerous. So amongst the simple models and those who work with them might be, for example, miracles are still real. And people like Stephen Lungu, the, um, uh, uh, I've, I've spoken about Stephen Lungu at, at the previous, uh, he's a great evangelist. Kari Tim Boom, you must know. And they will witness that miracles are real. Another one might be taking the point that the creation 
by God was literally over six days, according to the um, chapter one of Genesis. So the cosmos is 6,000 years old, and Ken Ham would, would put that over. But you get these very logical academic models, and in the miracle side, you can go, for example, to St. Augustine, or Thomas Aquinas, or C.S. Lewis, who has written a book called Miracles in which not everyone can read. Um, certainly one of the hardest that um, I enjoyed, took some time for really taking it in. In terms of the age of the cosmos, one would go to um, academics in the scientific and um, philosophical and the theological fields like uh, Kurt Wise, who's with Creation Ministries, Francis Collins, who's with Biologus, or Michael Sherman, who is the director and founder of Skeptic Magazine. And uh, some of these academic models are, your gender is what you want it to be. I'm not going to go down that path, but that's a model. Very common one that people talk about is Maslow's <coughs> um, hierarchy of needs. And I'm sure many of you have seen uh, this triangle, <coughs> which shows that people, first of all, have to satisfy their physiological needs before they look after their safety. And then once they're safe and they're being fed and housed, they wonder about their friends. And then they're worried about um, their, their esteem in the community and then they're really worried about do they make a, um, an impact upon the world what what is the meaning of life um, that all sounds great but those of us who are aware of the spiritual realm realize that that is not a metaphysical model at all it ignores the metaphysical world so it doesn't take into account the spiritual condition of anybody it doesn't take into account the influences of any spiritual entities, for example, God, um, angels and demons. And we uh, could go back into uh, philosophy and see that all this came up through David Hume and Immanuel Kant, and maybe one day we'll get to talk about them. Now, in terms of conceptual models of metaphysics, the kind of models you get are things like if you're involved with lying, theft, murder, and perversion, you're going to be punished after you die. Um, if you pray right and make sacrifices, you, may, you, you could get supernatural help. Uh, another one I'm aware of is people believe that if you have rock crystals, that you're going to have much better health and you're going to be a happy person. And then um, in Africa and around the world, increasingly people believe that if a witch curses you, you will suffer and die. Um, these are not paradigms. These are models. A worldview or a paradigm is not a model, but models work within and from worldviews. So you, a worldview would be uh, a biblical worldview, for example, that um, God is in control and um, he is... Uh, everything that the Bible says he is, and then the models work out of that, or else there is no God, and everything is an accident. In terms of witchcraft, you can see that people are modeling um, that there's an increase in uh, witchcraft, uh, people investing in it, and they're expecting it to increase uh, in the years ahead. Personally, <clears throat> I was asked way back in the 1970s by a civil engineer, um, if, you blast, if you're blasting rock, can you find out or predict how big the rocks are going to be? And as a result of that, I went and did a little bit of research and came up with a simple model in a few months. And that became the global standard, despite my warnings about its obvious limitations. Um, quite early in my professional life, I was exposed to artificial intelligence. People wanted to make me the, butter, the, the inside of an artificial intelligence system. 
uh, I didn't relate to that. And um, I've seen artificial intelligence developing over the years. And I have recently reviewed papers on artificial intelligence for blasting, and I basically think they're a lot of rubbish. Um, I got drawn into um, development of very complex numeric models with very good science uh, early in my life. And 40 years later, the original simple model that I developed is still the main one that is used around the world, although it has evolved uh, in, in simple ways using um, with international experts and my commu communication. So it's interesting that that is still a key um, tool that people use. Something that I discovered, not only in this but other areas, is that people who use and develop models have intense loyalties so that they tend to stick with a model that they like and um, not look rationally at what else is on, on offer. It, it affects their, their sense of security, I think. And you have to be aware of that in yourself and other people. You need to be able to face truth. And the other thing is that these models have an immense impact not only on working costs and uh, on the way things happen, but on personal relationships. If you have a different model to someone else, you can find that um, the relationship could break up. Just um, more uh, towards the end of my life, with these uh, numeric models, which are very, very difficult because um, things are happening at extremely high pressures and temperatures, and they're happening um, with difficult materials and you can't even see what's happening most of the time and it's hard to work to measure the results well anyway there's a particularly difficult um thing which is how does explosive energy get used up in the borehole close to the hole as the as the rock is being transformed by these intense pressures and nobody has been able to find a good answer to that. But I discovered a way of doing it because I had good relationships with a military guy and he came at it from a different direction. And I found a remarkably effective and easy way of, of pinning down that energy. And I published it and promoted it, but it's been largely ignored by the community because it undermines their own investment in their own academic programs because they have these very fancy numerical models which try and do the same thing. Um, yeah. So that uh, is just an indication of what I've encountered. And another thing I've seen <clears throat> is that models can short circuit reason instead of enhancing it. So the, the, people often said to me, look, if modeling is so inaccurate, if you're not sure, why do it at all? And my answer is, modeling makes you see more and ask new questions. You really learn a lot when you get into modeling. And then um, modeling is done, these are the two key issues, um, is done using convenient, but uh, questionable data, okay. Yeah, the data is very, the data are very core and people are not always good with it. Uh, important point, scientists are people. They need professional recognition and funding. And lay people tend to get over loyal to the scientists and the models that they look that they look to, and because they're over loyal to them, they support them and only them with cash and promotion. They tend um, to have their favourites. I mean, I favour C.S. Lewis uh, very strongly, but it doesn't stop me from looking at other authors and um, taking them seriously and thinking that Lewis is wrong sometimes. Anyway, because people have fallen and go like that, truth and progress tend to lose out. And certainly, 
in the multi-millions of dollars that I've seen spent on glass modeling. We really didn't make that much progress. Uh, so much of it went towards uh, keeping people politically happy. In terms of the data side of thing, to the lay people, the, both the science and the reasoning behind modeling is, is often obscure. And people who do science often have very good high level maths. And the high level maths with all these equations hides the poor science. <laughs> so you're impressed with the maths and you don't see actually this is, this is not good science. And then people claim that the statistics proves that their model is validated, but actually often the statistics are being used badly. I've definitely seen that. People always assume normal distribution and uh, they apply certain equations, but if you look at the data, it's not fitting it at all. And then the other thing is some people do wonderful work, get very good data, but they don't interpret it well. Um, and good data is quite rare. And fortunately, there's jealousy over raw data, and people are hesitant to let you have a look at it because you might change what comes out of it, and then their name is ruined. And people are apt to take good data or various data, and then they force fit it to make the model that they want it to be. Um, so I've seen all of these things. And I see it not only in blasting, but in all kinds of other areas. So the question is, why is this, um, why is this relevant to everybody? And um, sorry, I just want to look and see what the time is. Not being too bad. It's relevant because all of us are routinely vulnerable to technical and philosophical models. Uh, the people building and running the models enjoy and um, protect their position. Um, I was in Australia last year on uh, attending a patent case related to my expertise, and my the, the guy, one of the guys who was on the same side as me in the in the test case. He was telling me that with this model of mine, the simple model, he's made multi-millions of rands around the world using it. <laughs> so models are hugely important to individuals in that. And because they're important, they, they channel simple and important decisions that radically affect the viability of various operations. So we looked at um, COVID-19 infections and deaths. Uh, it's also affecting what money is spent on going to Mars. And um, I'm very concerned at the comprehensive sexuality education. I don't know how aware you guys are of that, but I, it, it's, to me, it's complete madness what's happening. But when you go and look at uh, the way it's promoted, it sounds like this is the best thing since sliced bread and it's going to protect your children. Um, but it's all modeled on what children, what uh, the statistics say is the problem with children. And then um, if you want to get down into the detailed arguments and question them, it's not easy to chase them down, especially when there's some secrecy involved, and there often is. Uh, trying to, as a layperson, talk with specialists who have all this data and these different models and references, it's, it's really difficult. So the question is, is there a solution to this problem? <laughs> the answer is yes. You see, all models eventually are promising uh, some route or other to health and happiness. Um, there's a purpose in the model, and people are, pursued, are persuaded to go along with them because they're going to make things better. And as Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Um, and you need to get past what the, mo what the model is saying and 
measure what is its impact on actual people who have been subjected to it or what is actually happening and learn from that because as C.S. Lewis says nature is very true in the way that it plays back to you whether it's real what you're trying out it's important to look at the sources and discern who are the good sources, not just the people who are looking for um, recognition. Don't be a sycophant. Don't suck up to people. Look squarely at stuff and watch your back if you're being truthful because people don't like it when, um, when you're whoops, um, challenging them. This is also true for faith models. So, for example, if you're looking at Marxism or Christianity or Islam, Islam or relativism, each of those models promises a better life. Well, go and look at people who are in there and tell me, is it better? Does it make sense? And when you look at the outcome, you're testing the core doctrine within that thing. And you, those are the things that really matter. And you need to be very careful what you dogmatize in a, in a model. In other words, what is the bit of the model that you will not move away from? Every model needs to have something that uh, fixes where it's going. And don't dogmatize things that really are questionable. And then this is the one I've really learned in every area. Don't expect other people to change their models easily. Um, it can take an awful lot of time for the penny to drop. Um, and you have to have patience. And sometimes you just have to recognize that it's never going to uh, go your way. The key to success is really in the Bible. It's in Jeremiah. Well, it's all over the Bible, but I like this part in Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 5 to 9. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Trusting in man leads to misery. It just is so. Um, and then blessed is the man whoops, who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Um, yeah, I've been in very dangerous situations in my life. <laughs> the Lord's brought me through. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green, is not anxious in the air of drought for does not cease to bear fruit. Trust in the Lord, it will go fine. And remember that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Who can understand it? Keep that as your guideline and it will see you through good models. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. And um, yeah, I can, I've got quite a lot more that I, that I could share, but I think I'll leave it open to comments and questions at that point. Awesome, Claude, thank you. Um, so as an, as an engineer and a wannabe theologian as that combination, I'm very uh, excited about some of the things that, you, that you're saying. Thank you, Claude. Um, I don't see a question yet. Anybody wanna either raise hand, use chat, uh, or even just unmute yourself and I'll know. Um, so, Rakadi. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Claude, for an interesting uh, presentation. And I think for me, the question has always been, and I speak as a, training, a, the a theologian in training, and I'm thinking back to in church history where whenever an idea was presented, a model, whether it was Christology or just any of the other doctrines of the church. And whenever it was presented, it was fiercely debated and engaged with 
to the degree where I could say lives were lost and people actually felt the consequences of whatever idea they put forward. So why, how, how did it happen that we got to a point where somebody could just say something and, it, and it's almost accepted without questioning or that kind of engagement where we test the rigor of the validity of what is presented? Yeah. I think there are two reasons. The one is that um, people are vulnerable to authority. And most of us are very reluctant to stand against authority and we want to fit in with everyone. We don't want to be persecuted for not following uh, what the authorities are saying. Uh, we want to have people pat us on the back. We all want to be saying the same thing together. Um, so we're vulnerable to, um, I think, uh, Hans Christian Andersen told a story about the king who had a new suit of clothes. He had a tailor. And the, the tailor tailors um, got the king to believe that they had produced the most beautiful suit, the most beautiful clothes, but a fool, only, only a wise man could see how beautiful the suit was. And they dressed him up in the suit and uh, the, everybody was told that the king was going to parade through town in, in, in um, these, this amazing clothing. And he walked through the town stark naked, everyone was cheering his wonderful clothing until the little boy who didn't know anything said, but the emperor has no clothes. Uh, and then everybody suddenly realized he didn't have any clothes. Or maybe they told him to shut up. I think there's a lot of that. Um, the other thing is that um, some of these things that, that people put forward make sense. And people want to believe them. Um, I think, uh, for example, uh, Nietzsche. It makes a lot of sense if you read him. Um, because he says things that you would like to believe that you can um, you 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 can be the superman if you rebel against everything. That's a powerful argument. So uh, it, everything in the end boils down to our failing to be humble and just trust God and wait a little bit. I don't know if that helps. Um, I just want to link up with what exactly Claude ended up on. Um, right at the beginning, when he started talking about modeling, uh, my first reaction was stereotypes are models. And we see the damage in the past that stereotypes and assumptions about other people have made. And the question is really, how do you break that cycle? How do you get people to recognize is that they are trusting a model rather than reality? I think the right thing, the right thing is to, to get the right model. So the biblical model is this. All human beings are fallen. Black as well as white. Male as well as female. Um, rich as well as poor. And um, it's a great mistake to elevate one population group over another and to say that those guys are all good and all victims and the other guys are all bad and are all oppressors. Uh, if we get back to biblical belief, we can sort this out. But when we um, just love people together, either for good or for bad, we get it wrong. Uh, the people need the gospel and us Christians, need not to back away from the fact that there is oppression and that we can do something about it. Okay, um, a question on the chat. Have you taken a look at any of the climate change models and the underlying data? If so, what do you think? Um, someone's inviting you to step right into it, Claude. Oh, you're taking the bait. <laughs> the climate change models are very specialized. And therefore, uh, I couldn't really 
get in and challenge that. But what I do do, and I think is relevant, is this. I have seen for a very long time that we're doing something wrong. We are squandering the Earth's resources and we are polluting nature at a ridiculous rate and in a ridiculous way. We don't need to do that. So whether the Earth is heating up or not, and it looks as if it is at the moment, we don't need to be doing all this stuff. We need to stop squandering. And uh, that's what we need to, to focus on. We should not carry on with the way we're behaving, even if it's not affecting the climate. We should not be do, squandering it. These resources are finite and they're, they're, they're poisoning us. Um, another one in the chat. Uh, Claude, what is the difference, in your opinion, between a worldview and a model? You sort of said they're not equivalent. You said a, a model works within a worldview, but just, just elaborate a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, again, this comes down to the issue of definitions, and different people will have different uh, definitions. Um, to me, a worldview is an environment uh, for setting the boundaries of models. So, for example, a biblical worldview um, admits that there is a God. And then you model what God's like. <laughs> and you model what people are like and what's going on in the world. If you are an atheist, you then say there is no God. And you then model people differently. We just become animals. There's no spiritual life. There are no miracles. Um, yeah. There's no more important question in the world than this one. Is there a God? It, 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 it's just incredible the, the, the fact that people cannot realize how critical this question is. And then the second question, if there is a God, what's he like? I know what he is and I know what he's like. I'm, I don't know enough about him. But at our peril, do we not take him at our peril do we take him lightly or disregard him? Isaac, you had your hand up. Thank you, Claude. Um, I'm wondering about our confidence that we can escape models at all. After all, we daily operate using models of the world. Um, our brains don't process all of the pixels that it sees because we have a model about what our room looks like and beyond that as we move around we also have models about how people behave we have certain expectations about you know when we drive around etc so you know if we talk about not trusting models it seems to me like those are explicit models but we have implicit models in our minds you know whether we identify them or not Yes, we do, and, and we, I, I have models, and I try to build my model as I get older to be better. Um, you need to be, you need to stick pretty close to the Bible, and then your models tend to be better. You tend to have better discernment as to, to what's right and what's wrong. Um, I, I, I accept that we all have models, and we've got to stick with them. But, um, Wrong models cause an awful lot of problems. Claude, we have one or two more hands. John, you're next. Well, thank you so much for your input. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm a minister. I probably classify myself as a conservative, both in theology as well as in practice. And it concerns me when I see a number of theologians putting models out for doctrine for practice and they come from reputable institutions um and i'm i'm concerned that because they're not put out into the general forum but they are leading their pupils 
that their models aren't always tested properly. Okay. Do you think con uh, that I'm being overly cautious in terms of my acceptance? Or do you think I should uh, be a little bit more generous in my acceptance? And uh, I, I normally say, prove it to me, show me that I'm right or that I'm wrong, and then I'll, I'll amend my perspective. Sorry, it's a personal question. Well, can I share that I didn't show my entire presentation this morning. There's a bit that I still held back to show. And uh, the bit that I held back is on a specific uh, theological model, and it's about the age of the creation. All right. And uh, you get a, a real, it's a, it's a hot potato, this. People yeah. are very reluctant to discuss it in public because of the emotions and uh, the uh, accusations that get thrown around. It's, it's actually a very difficult area. And I've been looking at this um, with another person who's of a different persuasion to myself, also a Christian, and I've had to think through what's happening and how do we handle each other. Because basically, the other person is calling me a heretic. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I, I think we will struggle with these things, but you need to look at what it does to the people who um, are doing the, argue, the, the arguing and sticking to it and, and the effect on the population as a whole. Um, does it have a healthy relationship, healthy effect on their relationships with other people and other Christians? Mm -hmm. um, is there humility in it? Or are they saying that they have the only, the, the only answer? Uh, and if you can keep talking, that's good. But uh, if there's arrogance, um, uh, you have to pray and wait. In, okay. in our church, we're going through some of these debates uh, as an eldership, trying to decide what is our church position on various things. And it's really good. We've got uh, the pastor and four elders, and two of the elders are young, and two of them are ancient like me. Um, we're having some good discussions, but there are some very different ideas. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Thanks. Well, there's a, um, there's a message that you probably cannot see that asks, is there a formula to stress test models at face value when you have limited information or data? Um, the, my answer to that is it depends on the risk of the stress test. Um, one of the problems that people uh, c that I keep coming up with is people want life to be simple. Uh, they want theology to be simple. They want uh, simple answers, and but when you give them the real answer, uh, they don't like it because it's not simple. Then they go to somebody who has a simple answer and they use that answer even though it's wrong. Um, life isn't simple. Um, well, it, it's very simple in some ways, but not in others. Uh, uh, I, I would have to know what the actual example is, and then I could possibly tell you. We do a lot of, in, in, in explosives and blasting, every blast is a, is a stress test. So I can speak with some authority. Yeah, because I suppose a follow-on from that would be, especially if we think about some of the models that we form ourselves on, how life and reality works. Um, we get we we get stress test data back that says a, a model that is may not be accurate, but we find ways of still chopping and changing and justifying anything not to lose our model. So it, it becomes yeah, I can I can see the complexity of that. I mean, in blasting, one of the issues is that you you can only blast one block of rock once. You can't put it together and then blast it again. So you, everything is a mm. stress test. You're going to break what you're, what you're looking at. And then a comment you can see, Claude, is, um, thank you, Claude. One of the points you made was 
look for good sources and with all that is happening in the world there are so many sources how do you judge what a good source is also with so many sources to look at how do you decide what is worth looking at so um i think answer the question with regard to a source of data as well as a source of models okay. in terms of a source of data um you need to look at the breadth of exposure that the data are coming from um, and how yeah i think one would have to take specifics in order to illustrate this properly but certainly people who do research real research uh, publish that data and you can go and look at it but if they're secretive about the data that's not a good sign um, the, old, the, the old company that I used to work for where we did a lot of very good work when they separated out from my company they, they tried to keep secret wonderful information that they had and that really limited me in some of the work that I did after that and when I got into a new organization, I, I, as part of the contract of the people who were financing it, I built in that they would release all experimental data within three years of, uh, of the report being released. So I, I don't know if I'm answering that well, but um, people publish, if they're going to say what they believe, they must show the evidence for it and uh, that, that helps a lot um, yeah in terms of source uh, the person that you're looking at humble people um, uh, it's a good a good indication that that they're worth listening to people who get upset with you when you when you question them um, that's always a sign to be very wary of it's not necessarily that they're wrong, but there's a good chance that uh, their stuff doesn't hold up too well. Can, can I ask you one, and I'm going to step right into it, and you're allowed to avoid it if you want. Um, do we sometimes impose our models on, for example, our Bible reading or on the way we do theology, the way we do worldview? We come with our preconceived mod grids and models of, of reading something. Yeah. And of course, we can't help doing that. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's what's caused uh, a lot of the issues, that um, people have favored interpretations of scripture. But um, clearly, um, Bible, the Bible can be interpreted in different ways. The question is to work out what's legitimate. And there, are, there is a set of uh, rules by which you should um, go in terms of interpreting, uh, seeing whether the interpretation is valid or not. Um, wishful thinking is often um, the result comes out of people misinterpreting the Bible or just taking proof texts there's a question here can it not be that one of the lessons and demands of our time is uh, tolerance of ambiguity yeah I'm glad that one came up I'm very strong on it um, ambiguity is a fact of life there's some things even in the Bible that are ambiguous and um, we need to acknowledge that there are some things that we don't have clear answers on um and the core cool thing is there are some things that are definitely not ambiguous so you need to tolerate ambiguity up to a point but don't compromise on core stuff core stuff uh, is stuff that you dogmatize you say on this thing i stand i will go no further that's the martin luther stand <laughs> Uh, but there are many things that are ambiguous and um, one such thing is, in my opinion, how old is the earth? 
you, you, I'm looking at different things. I've got, I've got a position on it, but I see ambiguity and um, issues on the sovereignty of God. Um, I believe that he is 100% sovereign, but I have different ideas compared with other people on how he uses his sovereignty. Um, you know, how uh, predestination and election, things like that. There's ambiguity in there. You need to acknowledge that, but up to a point. 